Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Rodrigo Rivera, and today we're going to talk about uh, a great trial that has been recently published. It's the BASICS trial, that it's the Basilar Artery International Cooperative Study that has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine recently. And today we have two very important guests, Dr. Seanville from uh, Netherlands. He's uh, the, the PI of the BASICS trial. He's a stroke neurologist with a great experience in stroke. He has participated in several publications, including the Mr. Clean trial. And he now works in the, in the University of Utrecht and the San Antonio Hospital. And he has been involved in the basilar artery registry since 2002 and in the basics trial since 2009. So welcome, Dr. Seanville. Uh, Thank you. To this interview. And we also have a, a, a very important intervention neurologist who is Francisco Montalverne. He's from Brazil, Fortaleza. He's a, he is the chief of the intervention neurology department at the General Hospital in Fortaleza and he's also the, the president of the Brazilian uh, Neurology Society. He has involved in several trials. Also, the very important trial is called the Resilient Trial. That's his been recently published in Brazil and that leads to the, the approval of the mechanical thrombectomy in that country. So welcome also Francisco to this interview. Good morning, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be part of this discussion. So we're gonna start with the, I would like to talk about the, the human phase of the, of the basics because I don't know if all the people are concerned about what it means to make a, a trial like the basic all the effort that is behind. So Dr. Seanville, as a PI, can you tell us what is behind the, the, the backstage of, the, of, of, a, of a trial like the basics? Uh, we have received a lot of appreciation uh, from colleagues all around the world uh, for the effort. Uh, I mean, people really see that it wasn't an easy trial to do. And we started uh, the basics registry, as you said, in 2002, because we thought, ah, it's so obvious that basilar artery occlusion should be treated with endovascular therapy. So let's do a registry uh, in order to avoid having to do a, a trial. Uh, and uh, much to our surprise, uh, we didn't find a significant difference in outcome between patients treated with uh, IV thrombolysis or endovascular therapy. And so we had to do this trial. And of course, there was a lot of resistance in the stroke community because many said, oh, it's not ethical to do such a trial. It was very hard to convince centers to participate, uh, especially high volume centers. Um, so it has been a, a long winding road. And so almost 19 years and not, uh, eight, of, eight years uh, running the trial itself. That, that's, that, that's impressive. Huh? So, um, Francisco, also you participate in the, in the in the in the trial, and you were one of the on the, on the, the third ranked uh, enrolled center for Talesa. So, what was his experience in, in becoming? How, how did you became that 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 uh, that enrolling number? Yes, uh, in fact, in Brazil it was a quite different situation because we did not have the device approved for use for endovascular treatment in the public health system. Uh, for your knowledge, 75% uh, of Brazilian population use the public health system. The private health system, uh, everybody has the access of the most modern technology for the treatment, just like the first world. But uh, uh, in our reality, it was easy to, be, to participate in this trial uh, because it was an opportunity for the patient to have the treatment. So all cases that we have in our center uh, were uh, enrolled in the trial. If they were not enrolled, it was due to contraindication, exclusion, the presence of any exclusion criteria. So it's an it's a interesting uh, uh, consideration because uh, when I analyze it, <clears throat> the results of our center, it was a little bit different uh, regarding the, the overall results of basics. So uh, it's interesting to discuss this afterwards. And that counts also for, for Rivera Preto and, 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 uh, and Porto Alegre also, that, that also participated it, in the trial. Yes, the, the reality in these three centers was the same. 
And uh, the, when we res evaluated the overall results of uh, basics in Brazil, we had an, a treatment effect of about 25% uh, regarding uh, ranking zero to three and 22% uh, when we consider as favorable outcome ranking zero to two. That's interesting, very interesting. So, so, so Dr. Chanville, uh, what was the community, you, you, you tell something about it, but, but what, what was the community feedback in, the, in these last weeks about the, the publication of the basics? Uh, there was some concern about selection bias, uh, something uh, that was suggested by the prior remarks. Um, but we did uh, randomize 70% uh, of eligible patients. And I think it's, uh, there, there's, there are many reasons for not randomizing patients. And if you look at the reasons in the trial, of those 30% of patients not randomized, most had very legitimate reasons not being randomized, which didn't influence patient selection. Uh, as mentioned in the article, uh, the most frequent reason uh, for not randomizing patients was the inavailability of study team, which unfortunately uh, was uh, a problem in many academic European stroke centers. Uh, so, uh, I'm not sure that the willingness to randomize patients was less in uh, countries outside Brazil. And uh, overall, I think uh, the uh, centers worldwide, stroke physicians worldwide, realize that, that the results are quite valid of the basics trial and that it indeed is true that endovascular therapy is less effective uh, in the posterior circulation than in the anterior circulation. So, 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 uh, what, what, what is the, the, uh, so, so as, as you said, the, the, the main uh, lack of, uh, of, of patient answering the, the trial of, that you said that, that the one that were not entered the, the randomization were, was the, the lack of the the, the team of, of the of the of the yeah. study team, uh, and but but those patients also went to the mainly went to to mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, yes, that that, that eighty percent of those patients that were uh, eligible uh, and were not randomized, eighty percent were treated with endovascular therapy. So 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 do you think that equipos uh, affected your your in the way that the, when you start a trial and when doing the trial, it did equipos in the in the in the in the head of the of the investigator or, or the centers affect the the, the, rec the recruitment or the or, 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 the, or maybe the the coming uh, patients to the trial? Uh, that's true for every trial. Uh, you do a trial because you you believe in a, in a in a type of treatment and you want to show its efficacy. And so there is always a subgroup uh, of patients that you feel reluctant uh, to randomize. Uh, but that's true for every trial. Um, it's unique for, for basics that we had uh, a registry. Uh, most anterior circulation trials didn't have such an obligatory registry. And so we know that 30% of patients were treated outside the trial. But I'm, uh, I'm convinced uh, those numbers are very comparable uh, to patients treated outside anterior circulation trials. So Francisco, in, in Brazil, do you, do you didn't have this problem of a patient that did, did not come to, to randomization or did you have it also? In fact, as I mentioned, in, in all the three centers in Brazil, uh, the patients who had the inclusion criteria were enrolled in the trial. If they, in the law, if the patient was excluded, it, had a, it was due to a, any kind of uh, exclusion criteria. So uh, uh, the, the, the numbers of Brazil are very real. Um, I don't want to say with that that the other centers uh, did not have a, a, a commitment with the study. It's quite complicated to judge this. And uh, 
I know that everybody was very prone to, to have a positive result of basic was engaged with the trial because it, there, there was a lack of evidence of a, a study devoted exclusively for basal <clears throat> stroke. So the question now is, uh, uh, how are we going to deal with basal stroke for now? Because uh, we have two trials that were negative. And uh, uh, I don't know uh, how are the guidelines going to be constructed using these two trials. Perhaps uh, I would like the opinion of Dr. Shonavid. Uh, maybe uh, for patients with uh, MIA higher than 10, with uh, occlusion de depicted by CTA or MRA, we will increase the evidence for 2, 2A or even 1A. Though uh, it's, we should admit that it was not the primary endpoint of the study, but perhaps we could uh, uh, increase the level of, of evidence and the recommendation of, for this kind of patient. And perhaps for the other groups, I mean, a patient with uh, uh, less severe stroke and young people, we could continue with 2B. Two, two I don't know what you think about that, Dr. Shanavil. Yes, I entirely agree. I mean, uh, had there was a lack of perceived equipoise among many dedicated stroke centers worldwide, uh, uh, for the last two, three decades, already 80% of patients worldwide were treated with endovascular therapy in specialized stroke centers. And those centers won't be convinced to stop treating patients uh, with an NIH stroke score of more than 10, uh, looking at the basic trial results. Mm. So I don't think there will ever be a trial uh, which will randomize patients uh, to uh, an arm which doesn't include endovascular therapy. Um, and I agree that patients with a minor deficit uh, should not be treated with endovascular therapy. And the trial confirms the findings of the basic registry and that patients with a minor deficit with a basal artery occlusion have a minor deficit for a reason. Uh, you can't occlude your uh, basilar uh, with only having a minor deficit if you don't have good collateral, good collaterals. And treating these patients really involves a risk. Um, so we should be very reluctant uh, to treat those patients with a minor de deficit. And a clear benefit in basics uh, is in the moderate deficits. Uh, 10 and 20 NIH. Um, I think that's a very clear group that we should treat. Uh, the patient with a severe deficit uh, center should consider to do advanced imaging. Uh, uh, just one, what's your opinion, Dr. Schoenville, about the treatment of patients with low NIH, uh, below 10, in the late phase, I mean, beyond four and a half hours? Because we, we most of the case that we have a good outcome in the, in the basic trial, they were enrolled in the early phase. So mm -hmm. most of the case, they did receive a TPA. But I, 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 I'm a little bit anxious to, to deal with this patient beyond four and a half hours that have a basilar occlusion and by an age of eight, seven, you know, mm -hmm. that sometimes that we do know that uh, the NIH score do not evaluate precisely uh, the symptoms and the severity in bus and in posterior circulation. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, sure, but it, I think that's that's a complicated discussion. Uh, but again, at the point I would like to stress, uh, there is a reason why patients have a minor deficit uh, having a basal artery occlusion, especially in those presenting late. If you had a basal artery occlusion for 24 hours and you still have a minor deficit, I mean, the chance of a good outcome is really good. And um, I would, I'm very, uh, I do have a very low threshold to treat patients late with IV thrombolysis, also based on the basics trial. The, the hemorrhage rate is really low lower than in the anterior circulation. And uh, of course, we don't have the information because we didn't treat many patients beyond four and a half hours of symptom onset. Uh, but 
it's, it's common sense. It doesn't feel good not to try uh, at least uh, with IV thrombolysis to open up the artery uh, if there's little risk involved. And so I would treat those minor deficits with IV thrombolysis even 24 hours later uh, because the risk seems quite low. Dr. Schombil, but I won't treat them with endovascular catheter therapy. That's very interesting. So, so in, in the trial, the, the, the results of the IV treatment in recanalization rates are very high. Do you think that's a special reason for that, uh, comparing anterior and posterior, or, or is that what, what happened? Yes, and, and that's the main difference between posterior and anterior circulation uh, is the amount of collateral flow. Uh, you have very good retrograde filling through the circle of Willis uh, if you occlude your mid basilar. Um, and of course, uh, IV thrombolysis is carried in bloodstream. Uh, if the blood supply is better, uh, thrombolysis works better. And do you think that, 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 that for example, tenecteblast uh, will, will have a role different from posterior, for posterior circulation than, than at least? Uh, I, I hope so for the patients with basal artery occlusion, and I hope so for the Australian uh, team, which had the post internal trial testing tenecteplase in the 24-hour time window uh, against uh, standard therapy for patients with basal artery occlusion. Uh, they recently got funding for this trial, which I'm also involved as an advisor. So, so in the ideal condition, what would it be the ideal conditions for the, the basic trial to, to carry on? More patients, maybe? Uh, of, of, of course, uh, had, would have helped uh, to have more patients. Um, the original power calculation, uh, we thought we needed 750 patients with a 10% absolute risk reduction. Um, if we would have been able to randomize 750 patients uh, within five years with more participating centers, we would have had a clear answer in a shorter period of time. But still, uh, our absolute risk reduction was less than 10%. And so we probably still have a neutral trial. And future uh, trials uh, should either be a lot bigger uh, especially when we want to uh, exclude patients with a severe deficit. If we would only focus on patients with a minor deficit, uh, we would probably need uh, 60, 75 participating centers and high volume centers for that to yeah, randomize during, enough patients. Uh, during the enrollment of patients, I participate in the selection of every patient. So sometimes I, I, I had a, a lot of doubts for, for patient selection, because uh, our workup here is based on CTCTA. And, and sometimes, uh, even though I am a neuroradiologist, I, I had a lot of uh, dif difficulty to evaluate the extension of scan core on CT. So do you think that uh, uh, if we had used maybe uh, MRI, would the results be different? And uh, I, would, I would be interested to, to know how was the percentage of patients that were involved with MRI because I, I did not find in the supplement. Uh, there, were only, there were very few patients uh, selected by MRI imaging. So we really can't say anything about that. Uh, I personally, uh, I'm very comfortable uh, evaluating CTA imaging and MRI. Our, uh, geography has other disadvantages. And of course, at the time of the basics trial, uh, we didn't know what to do with the, uh, with the imaging information. Uh, there, were, there were no trials or <clears throat> uh, large studies looking at the effect of patient selection with imaging. For, just prior to the, to the basics trial uh, in the registry and the years following, um, the CTP imaging uh, was very suboptimal. Um, nowadays, the CT perfusion images the whole brain at once. Mm. Um, but uh, the years prior to the trial, uh, the aim 
uh, was usually on the anterior circulation and you didn't even see the basilar territory. So we tried to collect CT perfusion imaging from the basics registry, but it was only useful in like 25% of patients. And you, you also they use the, the PC aspect just uh, after the, after the, 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 the treatment you have in the trial. Yes, but we didn't use it for patient selection. Yeah. Do you think that that, that could be important in future in future trials? Image sure. selection? Sure. But again, uh, if you uh, select patients, you will need uh, more uh, patients uh, to screen. And it is a rare disorder, so it will be very hard to get a significant number of patients. And as in the uh, anterior circulation, uh, and even more, uh, it's very hard uh, <clears throat> not to treat a patient with a severe deficit based on just CTP or MR imaging, because we all have the experience that a few of those uh, with bad imaging still have a good outcome. So, so do you think with, with, the, with, with the results of, of, of basics, we have to change the guideline as, as said Francisco? Yes, I think so. I think we have reason enough uh, to uh, increase the level of evidence uh, of efficacy of endovascular therapy in patients with a severe deficit. And, uh, and enough uh, evidence to be reluctant with the treatment of patients with a minor deficit. Sure. And Dr. Schoenewil, in your institution, how do you manage the patient with low NIH with basilar occlusion? Uh, do you tend to use a, a Batman score, PC, PC, PC uh, the posterior collateral score uh, uh, to enhance uh, the patient that could be a, a, a favorable outcome after mechanical thrombectomy. How do you manage low NIH patients with basilar occlusion in your institution? Uh, that, that, that's a very easy to answer. Don't treat them with endovascular therapy unless they worsen. Um, and uh, we treat them with IV thrombolysis, admit them to the stroke units. The moment they have an NIH stroke score, more than 10, we treat them. And again, because we don't have solid data uh, to properly select uh, patients uh, with a minor deficit uh, for endovascular therapy, we really need more studies uh, to increase the evidence to be able to select patients. Yes, I do agree. I think the fear of, of endovascular neurointerventionally should be stopped, at least for uh, low NIE patients. You know? so these are new milestones. Mm -hmm. uh, mechanical thrombectomy is not a magic wand. So sometimes do nothing is better than try to be the hero, you know? Yes, that's very true. Dr. Shamil, do you think that we are in, in, in place to, to make another trial in, in the world, to, 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 to try to look in for some results, different results that maybe some, some, some people still want to, that mechanical thrombectomy have an, a real effect in basilar artery occlusions? Yes, I mean, we should use the momentum of the basics trial results to do further trials, um, but not only trials, also real life registries. Uh, with large volume. Uh, uh, I already mentioned the post eternal trial, which will look at the efficacy of uh, tenecteplase. Um, it would be very interesting uh, to test different uh, devices or different approaches. And we could do a trial uh, testing uh, the efficacy of stent retrievers and compare it with uh, direct uh, aspiration. Uh, there are many more trials we can do on subgroups of patients yeah, and things like imaging selection that we could uh, test in large registries to look at the effect of uh, uh, imaging uh, scores on outcome better than we did in the past. Francisco? So, uh, just one comment regarding the points that uh, Dr. Shonovin has done. We have uh, discussed in the group of the basic uh, trial before the presentation in ZOC about the, the different strategies that we should use uh, according to the topography of the occlusion. Because uh, as you know very well, uh, the basilar occlusion is a very heterogeneous disease. 
And in the proximal and the middle basilar artery, we have a high prevalence of ICAT. However, the results of BASICS did not show a difference between the proximal and middle basilar occlusion and distal one. I was very, very surprised with these results. Would you make mm -hmm. a comment on that? No, I was as surprised as you were. And of course, uh, we have to look uh, at uh, the data available to better understand uh, why there isn't a difference uh, in location of occlusion, as we expect. Uh, another point that uh, I would like to, to consider regarding treatment strategies <clears throat> is that uh, though the prevalence of uh, anterior ICAD is higher than the prevalence of posterior ICAD, when you analyze just the population of posterior circulation, about one third of patients have uh, stenosis in basilar artery. And uh, it, 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 it was interesting because I was reading the supplementary uh, appendix of the New Journal, and uh, about one third of cases of uh, basic stride that was treated by endovascular route uh, used either PTA or stent. Mm -hmm. So, uh, of course, uh, everybody's aware that ICAD is more challenging to treat. And uh, I was wondering if uh, having one third of patients with ICAD in, in, the, in the basic trial would not have a bias in the results uh, in comparison to the, the result we would expect for anterior circulation and even for basic trial. What do you think about it? Now, yeah, we already mentioned uh, the big differences in collateral flow. And this is another example of a big difference between the anterior and posterior circulation. And so it's, it's, it would be very interesting to look at this subgroup uh, of patients with uh, basilar artery stenosis, residual stenosis after endovascular therapy. Um, and if they benefit, appear to benefit from stenting or not. Um, of course, a Chinese trial, the best, even included more patients with uh, basilar <clears throat> stenosis. I think they had more than 50%. Yes. Rodrigo, Rodrigo, do you think it's more challenging to treat basilar stroke or anterior stroke in your hands? Um, for me as a neurologist, it doesn't make much of a difference. Um, although the opinions are a little stronger in posterior circulation also uh, with my colleagues, uh, but I think the technical access in general is more complicated than the basilar. I do agree. And, and yeah, I, and Francisco. Yeah, I think it's the same. Because also we have less experience because there are less cases. So, so we, we feel more comfortable with the anterior circulation also strokes. So Francisco, what do you think as an interventional neurologist about the devices? What is the future of the devices in basilar artery stroke? So is it aspiration and the new aspiration device is going to make a difference? Do you think in, in opening the basilar artery? I, I do think that you should individualize the treatment according to the supposed physiopathology of the occlusion. So it's I, I, always I, I evaluate the level of occlusion to consider the underlying disease. But in general, I, I use in every single case a combined technique. Why? Because first, we, we cannot use a, a a proximal occlusion because uh, you know the, the the diameter of the catheters are not allowed in the vertebral artery in most of the case. Uh, secondly, we we have the odd the contralateral vertebral that maintain the flow. So we will be if we use a stent trivia alone, we will be more prone to distal emboli, and it's in, in the retrieval force will be lower because we will have the pressure of flow forward in, in a physical perspective. So uh, I either favor uh, aspiration technique alone or a combined technique alone according to the availability of material. Okay. I don't know if you do manage in the same way well, I think we we, had, we had, I, I like a lot of of, of I, I like the aspiration in the posterior circulation because I, when when you go up straight and then you just a blind uh, 
Do you know where, where, it, where it ends the basilar artery or do you know where, <clears throat> where it comes the, the posterior cerebral artery sometimes? So I think it's, I feel safer to go in for with an aspiration and, and start with asp aspirating the, the basilar. Another tip that that I use very usually is the radial approach. Yeah. Of course, it's very important to evaluate the vertebral arteries before because sometimes you punch on the right one, and the dominant vertebral is the contralateral one, so it makes a challenge to categorize. Uh, and uh, I'm very prone to use as well in proximal and middle occlusion. Uh, the, the 2B3A in inhibitors, if I have any kind of irregularity in the artery. Because sometimes we, we, I have faced problems like uh, I have done, uh, our team have done a uh, very beautiful thrombectomy and with a full perfusion. Mm -hmm. And uh, 24 hours after, there is an occlusion because we did not valorize a, a small stenosis and the irregularity in the artery. And in this case, in the presence of this kind of uh, uh, variable, I used to use a pharmacotherapy in the good phase that is not extensive impact in the intensity. I don't know if you manage this in the same way. It's very challenging when you have ICAT. Well, if, if, if we find an ICAT, we, we, use, uh, we have to stand it. We, we use the uh, anti blood therapy. But but you know that that's that, that's kind of a discussion because uh, in 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 the basic trial, Dr. Sean Bill, you have a, a very important difference in the in the hemorrhagic symptomatic hemorrhagic uh, complications between the medical and the and the, and the interventional group. So so you have a zero point seven uh, very low hemorrhagic complications in the medical group and a high complication or four percent nearly four percent. Complication uh, percent for complication in, in the in the in the interventional. What do you think about? In the interventional group, the hemorrhage risk was exactly the same as in the anterior circulation. The main difference was that the risk of hemorrhage was lower uh, in the best medical management arm of the basic trial compared to anterior circulation trials. Yeah, there the risk of hemorrhage was the same in both arms. But maybe I can ask the two of you a question. Uh, as a neurologist, I'm wondering uh, in what way the results of the basic trial uh, influence uh, your treatment approach in basilar artery occlusion. Uh, the trial shows uh, at least if there's a benefit of endovascular therapy, it's less than we expected. So did you notice in everyday clinical practice that you get a little less um, um, pressured to open up the basilar no matter what. So if you approach a patient, do an angiography, and you see a very complicated approach uh, with a dissection in one artery, in one vertebral artery, uh, a long step in occlusion in the other, and that you, it's easier to say, okay, let's leave this patient alone. Or if you don't succeed in your first two or three passes, that you don't attempt a fourth or fifth, knowing the basic results, knowing that endovascular therapy doesn't make that much of a difference. Well, that's a that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, uh, I haven't been in in that dilemma yet, fortunately. But uh, I think it, it, it's reasonable to now to to make the question if if what we are doing really have a, an impact in the, in the patient. So as you said, if we have a, a really tough case and two or three or passes and not, it's not possible to open the, the artery, probably we have uh, some, uh, some uh, we, we can be thinking about that the medical treatment also probably will not be too bad for, for, this, for this patient. Uh, I think, as, as you said in the beginning, and, and Francisco said, what, 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 where do we stand now for in the in the in the real life for 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 basilar artery occlusions? Are we going to dichotomize if the, the patient is uh, in a high or low uh, NAH or under over or ten or less than ten? I don't, I don't know what you think about that, Francisco. Yeah, uh, uh, Doctor Schoenfeld, I think the, this decision should be done before, you know. 
uh, uh, once we are in the middle of the war, it's quite complicated because uh, we, we should try to do something, in my opinion. But I, I'm very prone to, to select patient for endovascular treatment according to the severity of the stroke, as we have previously discussed. And in the elderly patients, uh, as we have shown in the trial, attendance of benefit of mechanical thrombectomy as well. Uh, uh, conversely, for the young patient, uh, the benefit of uh, mechanical thrombectomy was lower. So I think we, we, we have uh, good data now to individualize the, the, the choice of treatment uh, based on imaging. Uh, what I think I have discussed it here with many of our colleagues is that uh, we, we should, if we have a doubt, uh, individualize the treatment based not only on the conventional image, but also on, on advanced neuroimaging, uh, uh, mainly uh, uh, DWI. And the, for the question of the treatment, uh, I, I think the question should be, uh, why are we having a, a refractory thrombectomy? is very frequent, mainly in the posterior circulation, that the reason for that uh, refractoriness is I can. So if I have done one or two, or two pass with a good tech, with an optimal technique, I mean, the position of the stent tree is, a, is in a good position. Curation catheter is well placed uh, over the clot. There is not a big angulation on, on the basilar artery. Uh, if I fail with our optimal technique twice, I would be very prone to deploy an stent uh, because uh, it, the probability to have a, a high CAD um, as a reason for refractoriness is very high. So that would be my approach. It's, it, I would like just to remember uh, the comment I have done before and that Rodrigo said that she, he would prefer stent, I, I, I'm not saying that I don't use the stent. I, I, as a first glance, when I have an irregularity, even though I succeed from back to me, I'm, I, I used to use uh, pharmacological therapy with 2B, 3A inhibitors. And I, I, I perform a waiting test, 15 to 20 minutes. If there is no real occlusion, I let it alone. However, if there is real occlusion, or persistence of a clot in the artery, I tend to stent it. It's important to say uh, that uh, to place a stent is not difficult, but to save perforate is quite challenging. Yeah. So uh, I, 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 even though uh, it's easy for me to place a stent, I try not to do it if it's possible. Dr. Shambi, uh... Do we do we need to stop doing mechanical thrombectomies in the in now or, or do we have to select patients? No, we, we of course we have to continue uh, uh, treating patients with endovascular therapy, but uh, it's not something we have to do. I mean, we really have to look at the individual patients. Uh, we have to look at the stroke severity, age. Uh, general condition um, and uh, if one if the basic trial shows one thing is that uh, there is, there's really a difference between anterior and posterior circulation so we were right to do a trial just looking at posterior circulation with a different outcome than anterior circulation trials uh, and uh, it shows that there is a large uh, group of patients that still insufficiently benefit from endovascular therapy. So we really have to uh, improve our treatment approach in those patients. And Francisco, do you, do, is, is it in Brazil, the, resi the, the resilient trial, it has allowed the, the, the mechanical thrombectomy for stroke. Is it anterior stroke and posterior stroke? Any stroke? Or... Excuse me. Uh, in fact, we, we have just approved in the Brazilian Ministry of Health uh, the use of mechanical thrombectomy in the public health system. But uh, uh, we will have the funding to start it just next year. Okay, so it's, it's baby steps. We, we conquer a step after the other. 
And for this approval, we did include a basilar occlusion, M1 and dominant M2. That will be the large vessel field, let's say. Okay, that's good news. So Dr. Shambil, what would be the, 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 the a final message to the, to the audience for about the, the basic trials and, and, and basilar atrial occlusion? Yeah, so trials are very important to do because it really gives the insight in the efficacy of our treatments and uh, treatments that appear obviously effective and always as effective as we think. Um, and uh, that helps us uh, to uh, keep up spirit, always try to keep improving what we're doing. We really have to do better uh, with patients with basilar artery occlusion. We need more trials, we need large registries, we need more data because the patients with basilar artery occlusion don't have a fair chance at the moment. Okay, so thank you both for, for your time. Um, thank you for, for the present, it was a very nice talking and uh, I wish you both a, a good day and continued of the week. So thank you very much for being here. It was a great pleasure. It's my pleasure as well.